Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Two things before we get started. I'd like to wish my wife a happy 28th anniversary. Today, and right after I finish here, the car is back. We're on our way to Atlantic City to be friends for the next couple of days. All right. All right. Uh, second, I would like to thank Shalom Club for having me and inviting me here for all of your presence here today. Uh, this presentation was originally conceived uh, in Florida last May for Yom Hashoah. I was asked by the Valencia Shores Hadassah to uh -huh. do a presentation. And uh, a lot of the things that you see here today were incorporated, were in that presentation, but things have changed since last year. Lenny and I were back to Hungary last summer, and uh, a number of things have been updated in this presentation, as you'll see today. Okay. Okay, what you're looking at is a map of Hungary today. In 1939, Hungary had 825,000 Jews. 25% of them, 25% of those Jews lived in the capital city Budapest. They represented five to six percent of the population. And Jews have been in Hungary for about 1,300 years, so they're not something that's been there for quite a while. Uh, if you look at the map, there's a little star over here. That is the part of Hungary where I was born. It's a little town called Somershai, named after the River Somersh, which actually flowed through my backyard, as you'll see in some photos later on. And this is just a little aside. You can see right from underneath the stars of the town there called Mate Zalka. My father used to take me there on a bicycle for Sunday market, where he would uh, buy cattle, buy produce, or whatever. And um, last summer, Hungary and uh, Lenny and I were in Budapest and we visited the main synagogue, the Doha Yutsa synagogue. And it, some of you, I'm sure, have already been there. It's a very popular attraction. In the courtyard, there's a Holocaust memorial. And that Holocaust memorial was paid for by the American actor Tony Curtis, whose real name was Bernard Schwartz. What I never knew about Tony Curtis uh, is something that I learned by reading the plaque. He dedicated the plaque, he dedicated the memorial to his parents, who were from that town. Being that the Hungarian population was very close and rather small, there's no doubt that my grandparents probably had to know Tony Curtis's family as well. Okay, now, before World War II, The population of Samoshai was about a thousand people, of whom there were 25 Jewish families for a total of 113 Jews. After World War II, there were three Jews who returned to town. Rosenfeld Dejo, that's my father, Gross Abraham, and his nephew, uh, uh, Gross Miklos. A number of survivors immigrated to the United States, Canada, Australia, and other countries. My family had a long history in Hungary, family members proudly serving in the army during World War I. This is my grandfather, Moses Hershkowitz, and during World War I he was captured and he was, a POW, he was wearing a POW uniform in France and he sent this picture back to the family. This is a group photo of the Rosenfeld family taken in the 1920s. Now, I'm not 100% certain, but I have reason to believe that that is my father here before he lost his hair. And this is his younger brother, Al Paul. The same hair Okay. This is the original Paul Rosenfeld, or Paul Rosenfeld. Okay, uh, I am named after him. He was killed in Auschwitz. Now, my uncle Paul was a self-taught musician. He made his own violin, which he then taught himself to play. He was also an avid fisherman, fishing in the Somers River, which was literally in my backyard. Now, I too have some musical abilities and definitely love fishing. 
I assume that some of his genes have found their way into me. This is Serena Rosenfeld Seltzer, my father's sister, who was smart enough to leave in the 1920s and avoided the Holocaust, lived in the Bronx before the war. Okay. These are the Hirschkowitz women. Uh, my mother's town is Changer. Changer is just a few miles away from my hometown, where I was born. And in this photo, oops, wrong button. Sorry about that. In this photo is a picture of my mom and her younger sister, Yoli Olea, and my grandmother. And the Hirschkowitz woman of Changer, from left to right, once again, my aunt Yoli, my grandma, and my mother, whose given name was Sharolta, which became Sarah later on. I, this picture had to be taken sometime around 1938. In this photo, from left to right, you have my mom, my great-grandmother, and grandmother. Okay. As you can see from this photo, my mom was pretty easy on the eyes. She was a very beautiful woman. <coughs> Chengar, the home of the Hirschkowitz family, was six miles from Summershine, which was my father's town. My mom would take me there sitting on the crossbar on her bicycle. Chengar had a large Jewish population by 1820, and they built this large synagogue. In 1903, the community contributed 10,000 gold coins and built the addition to the synagogue, which housed the elementary school. At this point, the Jewish population of Chengar in 1912 was 800. During the war, the synagogue was destroyed. The, the sign on the building, right over there, basically translates to Israelite elementary school. My grandparents were grocers, and this was their store in the town of Chengir. And the uh, sign literally translates to uh, mixed goods store, like dry goods, they sold sugar, uh, cloth, whatever, a little general store. And they were quite successful. This is a photo that I took in the 1980s, actually, of the uh, Jewish cemetery in Chengir. And some of the gravestones go back to the 1700s. So as I indicated before, there's quite a lengthy history of Jewish residents in that area. This is the photo of my father's first wedding. Okay. He was married to Ilonka. They had three daughters, and they were all killed at Auschwitz. None of them came back. Uh, he rarely spoke about his first family, but their loss scarred him deeply, and he became a very angry man. Okay. Munka Sogolat. Hungary entered World War II on the side of Germany. Jewish men were not allowed to serve in the regular army. Instead, they were forced into what was called the Munkasogolet, which roughly translates as labor service. It was essentially forced slave labor. Most men did not return. This photo was taken in 1940. One of these men is Chandor. Okay, he mailed his postcard to his wife in Somershai. The men are smiling and washing around and playing with their bayonets and rifles. The photo was taken before Hungary became involved in the war. Okay. The Invisible Bridge is an amazing book. It's about 700 pages, but once I picked it up, I couldn't put it, uh, put it down. In fact, I finished it in about three days. You can change the name of the main character to Deja Rosenfeld, because this is my father's story, right up to the very end, where he deals with the family's escape to Austria in 1956. I was fortunate to meet the author last year at the Valencia Shores Women's Club meeting. In fact, Lenny and I flew up early from Florida just to make sure that I would be there 
and to be able to speak to her. I showed her some of my father's mementos. She was very appreciative, having never actually seen some of these items. If you haven't read it, great book. The slave laborers, laborers were forced at gunpoint to build roads, dig trenches, work in mines, and clear minefields frequently by walking through them, causing them to explode. Most of my father's forced labor took place in the cities of Minsk and Pinsk. At that time, it was part of Ukraine. I believe now it's part of Belarus. Now, of all the men, only two <coughs> came back from this group, and they started out with about 400. My father would tell me that uh, if somebody got sick in the line of work or uh, collapsed, the uh, officers would just basically point, point a rifle at them and just shoot them, kill them right then and there. <clears throat> this is a photo of a professor from Brooklyn College. His name is Bela Karali or Bela Kirai. But there's a lot more to it than his tenure at Brooklyn College. While attending Brooklyn College as an undergraduate in the late 1960s, I took many military history courses. There I had an amazing professor, Bela Karali. He was a Hungarian general who actually led the military uprising against the Russians in 1956. Like the Rosenfelds, he escaped Hungary in the aftermath of the revolution. He had to flee to save his life. All the politicians and military men and the hundreds of college students who, who took part in the uprising were taken to Russia and were either hanged or shot. Okay, uh, he died in Budapest in 2009 at the age of 98. His New York Times obituary revealed an amazing fact about this man which brings it into my presentation today. When the Germans moved in in 1944, Bela Kirai who was a military officer at that point, who went on to become general, was in charge of one of these Hungarian Jewish war brigades. Okay. He respected his men. Uh, he argued that during World War I, Jews fought valiantly for Hungary, and they deserved to be treated equally with everyone else. The Germans ordered him to have his men strip of their Hungarian army uniforms and put on labor uniforms. He refused the order. The men that served under him survived for the most part. Now, he never discussed this. He never knew about this while he was uh, teaching at Brooklyn College. In fact, I didn't find out about it until after his death. Um, after he died, well not after he died, uh, at some point later on in his life, he was right, uh, recognized by the Israeli government. He was nominated by the men whose life he protected. And you can now find him, at Yad, his name at Yad Vashem in Israel, as one of the righteous Gentiles. In 1944, all the occupants of the Mate Salka ghetto, where my family was being held, were deported to the Auschwitz-Birkenau, where my mom was forced, oops, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. When my mom was forced out of the cattle car, she saw a stretcher with a covered body on it. Only the shoes were exposed. My mother recognized the shoes. Her grandmother, I'm sorry, her mother, my grandmother, died in a cattle car, taking her to Auschwitz. The Hungarian Jews, were then led to the selection line where Dr. Joseph Mengele was waiting. When my mother and her sister approached Mengele, he sent my mother to the right, okay, she was 22 years old at the time. Okay, her sister Yuli, who was 15, was sent to the left, separating them. At this point, my mother became hysterical, yelling, that she wanted her sister to be with her. She did not want to be separated. Her effort was successful. Bengala pointed to my aunt and told her to go to the other side. 
Little did my mother know, she just saved her sister's life. Okay. This is one of the biggest lies for sure. Our my, our my, my three were Macy Freitas and the infamous gate over Auschwitz Birkenau. Okay. While in Birkenau, my mother survived on daily supplies of bread and watered down soup, scraps of food, including stolen potato peels. She worked in a factory making cots for the German army. Many people died of typhus in the crowded barracks where each held 36 wooden <coughs> beds. Fortunately, the Hungarians were the last Europeans to be deported to Auschwitz in May of 1944. Auschwitz was liberated one year later. My mom did not realize she was in Birkenau until 50 years later. She always told me she was in Auschwitz. She didn't realize the difference. Okay. Uh, on the 50th anniversary of Auschwitz, the liberation of Auschwitz, Auschwitz, my mom was visiting her sister in Israel, and her sister talked her into going with an Israeli delegation back to Poland to visit the concentration camp. It was at this time that she realized that she actually was being held and working out in that Auschwitz, which is basically just across the road. She regretted that she made that trip. She had many nightmares after the visit. 600,000 Jews were killed between 1941 and 1945. Most of them, by the way, in the last year of the war when there was a huge effort to get them into Auschwitz and carry out the final solution uh, with Eichmann. Today, today, there are 48,200 Jews who remain in Hungary. Of those, about 10,000 are observing the religion. The, uh, religion. Uh, this is a typical scene from a, uh, a, 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 a barrack, rather. I'm trying to think of the word barrack in, in Birkenau. It's exactly the same as what Lenny and I saw when we visited uh, Therese in, in Czech Republic a number of years ago. I don't know if any of you have ever visited any of those camps. Theresa was one of the better ones. Huge, uninsulated wooden barrack with uh, triple high bunk beds, straw mats. Uh, there was one small wooden stove in the front of the building. And when I say a small wooden stove, I mean like a really small pot belly stove to heat it up during the winter months, there was no way that that was going to work. In addition, there was an indoor outhouse, meaning at one end of the uh, barrack, there were, there were basically these swinging doors like you would find in the old Western movies. And in there, there was a wooden platform with a hole in it. And it was an outhouse, in-house. I could just imagine the, the stench with all these people living in there you know, under these conditions, is it a wonder that typhus and other diseases killed so many of the people? Liberation occurred in 1945. I'm sure you've seen these pictures and pictures like this of the uh, survivors at the concentration camps being liberated by either the Russians or the American soldiers. After liberation, Many surviving Hungarian Jews opted to move to Palestine or other countries around the world. Many lived in DP camps in Germany where they were able, while they were waiting to emigrate to their new homes. A number of my like, cousins and friends were born in German DP camps while their families waited to leave for the United States. My parents opted to return to their homes in Hungary and see who was still alive. Okay. After returning, my parents found that most of the family members had been killed. My, un my uncle, Paul, had dated my mother prior to the war, and my father had known her. They got together. My father made a very unusual proposal. He said to her, you were good enough for my brother, not good enough for me. She accepted. And two weeks later, they were married. 
My mother cooked the food for the celebration, and this is a photo of their wedding reception. Now, while back in Hungary this past July, I uh, picked up a little bit of insight about my father's personality. This was told to me by a number of the townspeople. They said that uh, according to the townspeople, they found my father to be remarkably resilient. After he returned to town, he appraised the situation, moved back into his house, which was vacant, and within two weeks, he was able to get the farm up and running again. He went out, he bought livestock, planted the crops for the uh, upcoming season. He kind of had to do that. He couldn't go to Wegmans and get what he needed. I mean, if you didn't have it stored away for the winter, you weren't going to do that. Okay, this is a photo of my aunt's wedding. My aunt was still in Hungary in 1947. She and her fiance, Joseph Goldstein, left for Palestine in 1948. This is her wedding picture, and it was the first wedding I attended. <laughs> if you look over there, that little fella over there is me. Okay, standing on the right is my mother's uncle, uh, Yeno Helmetsi. There he is, the handsome man with the hat. Uh, he had, his family's survival story is amazing. Okay, he had eight children. The entire family survived. They were on their way to Auschwitz in a rail car. The train was bombed. Okay, it was chaos. The doors opened up. They escaped and ran. Okay, and they made it. They all eventually immigrated to the, to the United States. The last of the remaining siblings is still alive, so lives in Protection, New Jersey. Okay, that's me. Okay. I lived in Summershy for the first uh, nine plus years of my life. It was in the third grade when we escaped Hungary. Summershy was a small town with one general store, a barber shop, a liquor bar, where, by the way, in Hungary, I don't know if it's changed, there was no age limit. Uh, it was only nine when I left, but I remember going in there buying a beer. <laughs> or buying, you know, my big thing was getting uh, salsa or whatever. But anybody could just do that. Okay, our home was lit with a kerosene lamp. We had one of the few radios in town. It was powered by a large battery, some of my father's friends would come to us at night and listen to the radio broadcast. The men, the men sat around uh, the room, uh, peeling apples fresh from our Jonathan Apple Orchard. The River Summers, which is a tributary of the uh, Tisa and Danube Rivers, literally was in our backyard. We grew all our own vegetables in our garden. Dad had a barn with several cows. Each evening, Mom would milk the cows, stuff the geese with corn to fatten up their livers. I drank fresh milk every day. Mom used that milk for making homemade fresh hand churned butter, sour cream, yogurt, and buttermilk. On Friday mornings, my parents would have challah, would bake challah, and the bread to be eaten during the week. My father made a good living by town standards from his apple orchards. Rather than sell the apples to a middleman, he would arrange for a truck to carry the apples to Budapest, where we go to the central market and sell it full retail. I spent summers playing soccer with my friend Oladar and my dog Bundash. Bundash in Hungarian means furry. My parents got me that dog when I was a toddler, and the dog was furry. So I said, it's furry, that became the same. Okay. Often my father would ask me to keep an eye on the cows as they grazed uh, near the river in, in our yard. I would take the cows out in the morning for several hours and they'd feed on the uh, grass. And then later on in the afternoon I would bring them back my mom would milk them in the evening. My parents worked hard and long. Farming was dangerous. They nearly died when both were poisoned by nicotine pesticide they were using in the apple trees. Uh, OSHA was not around in those days, you know. <laughs> they were spraying the apple trees. It was a very hot day. They were, they, they were not covered up. 
and some of the vapor got onto the skin. When they inhaled it, they came home, and they pretty much both uh, passed out and became unconscious and had to be taken to the hospital, which was quite a distance away. There were no doctors or hospitals anywhere near where we lived. Uh, where they were given antidotes and nurse back to health. I was about five years old at the time. It was a very frightening time for me. A family friend from Chengar stayed with me until my parents returned home. Okay, my hometown in 1956. No running water, no indoor plumbing, no paved roads, no telephones, no doctors or dentists, no electricity, Okay, a uh, couple of anecdotal <coughs> stories at this point. Uh, no, uh, no doctors, for example. Uh, my mom had a second child who was premature. She was born in the seventh month. Now, I don't know if she would have survived had they had a hospital nearby because seven months could have a tough time, but there was, there was no doctor to see her, and they baby lived for several days passed away. And another story which is a little more personal in nature. I was four or five years old and I had a toothache. My mother had to take me to the doctor, uh, to the dentist rather. Well, the dentist slash barber, okay, was in a nearby town called Port Chalmo, which was across the Summer River. We'd take a ferry, she took me on a bicycle. Okay, we went to the house where we lived. And they said, no, he wasn't here. He was at the Culture House, which was a uh, community rec center. <laughs> we find him there. And my, my mother tells him that my son is having a toothache. He reaches into his pocket, takes out a pair of pliers, <laughs> takes a match, sterilizes the, the uh, pliers with the match, says, open up, and pulls the tooth. That was the kind of medical care. And by the way, as you'll see in a few minutes in some photos that I'll show you, I don't think it's changed much. Okay, um, by the nearest synagogue was four miles away to which we walked on the high holidays. Okay, in 1950, we received a gift package from my father's sister, Serena, who lived in the Bronx in the United States. The package contained chocolate, peanuts, which I had never seen before, by the way, it was a big thing for me, and used clothing. Tucked into a jacket pocket was a $5 American bill. Two days later, two men in leather coats came to the house and asked my father. They were members of the AVOH, or AVOSH, Hungarian Secret Police. They took my father away. Unknown to us, the package was searched by the government before being delivered. He was sentenced to two years hard labor in prison, five years probation, and a monetary fine. Under the communist regime, possession of U.S. currency was a serious political crime. From 1950 to 1953, my father was in jail. My mother had to do the work of both of them for two years while he was gone. She took me to visit him in prison several times, but it was a long, arduous trip. We had to travel many miles by horse drawn car and steam railroad. This is the actual document, okay, with the court. Okay, you can see the date. Uh, sentencing him two years, two kept uh, two years, and was sentenced to prison, five years probation. By the way, when we left in 1956, he was still on probation, so I'm glad we didn't get caught. Okay, these are, uh, this is the identification papers that we had to carry, registers, uh, our home. Uh, very interesting story here that just, I realized this year, look at the number over here, 31. Yeah, I was born at 31 Petofi, which is a Petofi Hungarian national poet. Okay, my email address is paulr31. There's a reason for that. Okay, I lived at I didn't realize that I was born at 30 at 31 Perpetua Figuza. I lived at 31 Terrence Drive, 31 Lancaster Avenue, oh 31 Lancaster Avenue. Yeah. 31. Cheryl. 
31 Cheryl Avenue, 3100 Bright 3rd Street, okay? It's kind of weird. Now I live at number eight. Okay, this is my father's national ID card. You know, where you can see that, that our name was spelled a little differently there, the, the Z. And, um, Uh, now, anti-Semitism in Hungary was always present. My parents considered changing the name to a Hungarian name. The name that they chose was Rudas. The government was act actively pushing Jews to change their names uh, to Hungarian-sounding names. Our friends Gross Miklos became uh, Gati Miklos. Our friend Schwartz Miklos became Sheepos Miklos. And we were ready to change our name as well. A couple of months ago, one of our friends told me about a movie that's on Showtime. You may have seen it. Uh, Ralph Fiennes is in it. It's called Sunshine. It, it deals with the Hungarian family, the Zonenshine family, over three generations. Ralph Fiennes, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Okay, he's the star. He plays the lead roles in all three generations of the, of the family. And he is a prominent, he becomes a very, uh, prominent athlete in Hungary. His uh, skill is in fencing, and he, they wanted to join the Hungarian Olympic team, but he can't join the Hungarian Olympic team unless he changes his name. Because that's, with the Jewish name, they will not accept him. This was very typical of Hungary. <laughs> and my aunt, who was living in Israel, finally convinced my parents to emigrate and leave Hungary. We applied for a visa to emigrate uh, in 19, October of 1956. However, world events and history intervened. This is the actual uh, visa from the Israeli government dated October 1956. We were getting ready to leave. Okay. On October 4, 1956, the visa to Israel had been granted, but historical events were to change the plans. The Hungarian uprising of October to November 56. In October 23, 1956, Hungarian university students demonstrated against the government. Gunfire erupts and many are killed. Full scale battles are fought between the freedom fighters and the Russian military. At first, the Hungarian seems to force, by the way, the Hungarian military it was being led by that general, Bela Kirai, who I spoke about before. Uh, at first, the Hungarians seemed to force the, Hungary, the Russians out, but the Russians returned. As a result, the residents of Somershai blame, of course, the two Jews that lived in town. Okay? I get beat up in school and get called that famous Hungarian term, Peter Shino. Peter Shino, which, which is the most prominent anti Semitic rant against the Jew in Hungary, literally translates to stinking Jew. Okay. I get beat up after school. That evening, there's a torchlight demonstration held in front of our house. At that point, my father makes up his mind. We must leave, and two days later, we're on our way. Adele Nei. Nei, by the way, is a Hungarian term of endearment. You know, you, what you do is you say somebody's name, like my mother was shoddy. So a younger person would call a shoddy name, like Aunt Sarah. This is Adele or Aunt Adele. Okay. My father tries to sell off as much of our property as possible in the short time that we had. What he couldn't sell, we simply left behind. A Jewish friend in a nearby town had dealings with smugglers, and my father asked him to find us someone who would take us across the Hungarian border to Austria. With forged travel documents, we traveled to Budapest, a city that at this point was heavily damaged by the fighting. <coughs> Russian tanks and soldiers with submachine guns were everywhere. We stayed at Adelaide's house. Okay, she was a close friend of, a friend of the family who we visited regularly, and sometimes she would come to visit us in Summershine. After a few days, we were contacted by the smugglers who instructed us to take a train to Watertown. 
and followed the directions and arrived at a safe house near the Austrian border, carrying out uh, carrying all our possessions, including photos that you view today, uh, with the two men. Okay, at night four, we began walking toward the Austrian border. The journey was supposed to take two hours. The night was cold and clear. Thousands of Hungarians were escaping to Austria in the aftermath of the failed revolt. To stop the escapes, the border police lit the skies with a steady barrage of bright flares that illuminated the ground below. Four hours into the journey, we realized that something was wrong. I was cold and thirsty, and also very tired. The only beverage for me to drink was a bottle of homemade brandy Slivovitz that my father brought along, and I drank it. We were lost. After another hour of wandering aimlessly through farm fields and woods, we came to a paved roadway with a modern-looking building nearby. The smugglers decide that we're probably in Austria, and one of them says, you know what? Let me go knock on the door, find out where we are. Let's check it out. Well, not a good thing. A lady in a bathrobe answers. She blows a whistle. We are trapped. This building is a border police outpost. The building lights up like a Christmas tree. The smuggler is detained. Searchlights are aimed at us. And we are ordered to surrender. We decide to run. The sky lights up like the 4th of July. Gunfire is heard, and tracer bullets are coming toward us. Lucky for us, their rain was bad. In all the chaos, the second smuggler who was captured got away, and he managed to rejoin us later on that evening. Now for my Twilight Zone experience. To this day, I cannot explain this. We were exhausted and still lost, sitting on our suitcases in an open, muddy farm field somewhere in Western Hungary. It's probably three or four in the morning. Okay, now, just imagine yourself, three, four o'clock in the morning, in one of these farm fields here in Freehold that's been plowed and it is muddy, but there are no street lights, so it's going to be really dark. Okay, a young man in his early 20s approaches us out of nowhere. He's wearing a leather jacket. And he asks us, what are you guys doing? <laughs> okay. We tell him our story and tell him that we're lost. He tells us that he's heading to Austria to visit his sister. We ask him, can you possibly take us along and guide us? Okay. He says yes, but points out that it was getting close to dawn and it would be dangerous to make the crossing at this time. He asks us to follow him to a nearby town where he had friends that would allow us to wait for nightfall. We followed him, rested up during the day, and at nightfall we left. The crossing into Austria was totally uneventful. After about an hour of walking, we came to a ditch in the ground. We walked down into the ditch, come out of it, we're on the other side. The young man turns around and tells us, you are in Austria. This is a photo that was taken at the first DP camp where we were in Vienna, Austria. There's a straw mattress on the floor. We we're all sitting on one of the one of the beds. Okay, we spent the first month in Vienna in a building that was a public school. We slept on mattresses on the floor in tight quarters. Okay, look at the gym bags that you see hanging on the wall. They all say Care USA. That organization was really helpful to the refugees. In fact, uh, every year they got a check from me because they really appreciated what they did. Vienna was a new world for me. I saw my first banana, an orange, and saw my first black person. Okay. This gentleman over here is Gros Miklos. He is the one that I mentioned to you earlier. He lived in my hometown. Uh, he changed his name to Gatti Miklos. They owned a fast food, a, a kosher takeout place at MPJ in Brooklyn called Canary Foods for many years. The family 
met a series of tragedies after they came to the United States. He died of an early heart attack. His wife, who's over there, uh, also, uh, she, I believe, died of brain cancer in her early 50s. Their daughter, Agnes, who was my friend and playmate from, from my town, that's me, by the way. Okay, uh, she was a teacher at Fort Allen High School in Brooklyn, home economics department, she collapsed. She had a massive cerebral hemorrhage, okay? So, they did not do well. The only one that survives is George. George lives in Rockaway, and uh, he's probably in his early 60s at this point. Okay. The next six months, the next eight months, eight months rather, were spent in Cornerburg, a town of the Danube River, uh, in Vienna, Austria. Ironically, the camp we were in only 12 years before was the Nazi military base. Signs warning of danger and landmines were still posted throughout the perimeter of the camp. After spending nine months in the Austrian displaced person camp, being vetted by the United States State Department, they wanted to make sure my father wasn't a communist, by the way. Okay, we were finally cleared to leave for the United States. We arrived on September 18th, 1957. Our family met us at the St. George Hotel in Brooklyn. My great uncle Sam Hershkowitz was our sponsor. He found us an apartment in the Bright Beach section of Brooklyn, found jobs for my parents. I started school and our new life in the free America had begun. To quote my mom's uh, favorite saying, which was pronounced with a very thick Hungarian accent, God bless America. Okay. My parents became proud American citizens uh, in 1962. They applied for uh, citizenship at the earliest opportunity, and uh, I became a citizen at the same time. I didn't get my certificate until after I was 18. Okay. Okay. They returned back to Hungary two or three times to visit old friends who had stayed behind. Uh, in the picture that's coming up in a little while, you'll see that I'll be standing by that same sign a number of years later. Okay, this is a monument to the lost Jewish community of Changer. The monument is in Israel. You can see Changer spelled out there in Hebrew. My late aunt is pointing to the Shai inscription on this Holocaust Memorial, also in Israel. This is a picture that was taken in uh, 1988, one year before the communist government fell in Hungary. Our old great aunt Dairy Bomb was turned into a residence when we visited in, in 1988. Today is abandoned and it's again. Okay. Uh, in 1988, Lenny and I visited Hungary. It was still a communist government. We did not go back again until last summer. Many people asked why I didn't return. Lenny and I travel a lot, and in our travels through Europe, we've met many Hungarians. They say, have you been back? Why didn't you come back? I, I never really wanted to tell them why, but I really didn't want to go back there at all. Uh, I didn't want to go back because of all the unpleasant memories. Okay, the new resident of our family property was an elderly woman who converted a dairy barn into a home. How she got the stench out is beyond me. I just don't get it. I know what that smelled like. I mean, we had several cows, we had pigs, we had, at one point we had horses, and uh, manure every day. Uh, the, the structure you're looking at in this photo, was this picture was taken in 1988, but it still stands today. It was built by my father, and it still stands. It's, it was built for drying corn. After you harvest the corn, you put it in there, it was, the wood slats to allow the air to circulate, and the corn would dry out, which then you would use for animal feed. Okay, if you look to the right, right around here, you're gonna see our modern 1950s style outhouse, okay, complete with newspapers to be used for toilet paper. Okay. This was my friend Oladar Gabor, Gabor Boyne, 
Uh, and this picture was taken, like I said, on my first trip back uh, in 1988. Are you hungry today? Okay, we found Budapest to be a beautiful city. However, Hungary is still deeply anti-Semitic. The coalition has a large block of far-right members of the so-called Yobik party. Now, I have to give you a little lesson in Hungarian. Yob means better. It also means right, as in right or left. It's a very appropriate name as far as they're concerned because they're, they're right of center, they're a far-right government, and they, of course, feel that they are right. Okay, this group is known to wear Nazi-like uniforms, hold anti-Semitic parades in Budapest and elsewhere in Hungary. Uh, Budapest tour guide to the Domai Nutsa synagogue, as well as the docent in the synagogue museum, confirmed to me that anti-Semitism was still a major problem in Budapest and they were affected by it regularly. Summer Shai 2016. Okay, most of the homes in Summer Shai today have been rebuilt and are made of cinder blocks with the roofs, uh, with tile roofs. When we left, they were made of mud bricks and had straw roofs. That's what I lived in. One room house with a uh, wood fireplace, wood, uh, wood stove, right, not a fireplace. Uh, most people today have indoor plumbing, all have electricity. Some of the people have cellular phones. When I left Summer Shai in 1956, electricity was just being brought into town for the first time. The electric company installed one hanging light fixture in our one room home and one wall switch. It would work only for a few hours in the night and it was turned off by the company. Okay. Even the installation of the electrical service involved an act of anti-Semitism. Metal standoffs were needed to attach uh, the electrical wire into the homes to bring the power lines in. The townspeople decided that the iron rails around the Jewish cemetery would make ideal uh, supports for the electrical wiring, so they dismantled the cemetery around the Jewish, uh, they, they dismantled the fence sorry, around the Jewish cemetery. So if you look at the photo of the cemetery that I'll have for you later on, you'll see that there is no fence. Hey, this is the same sign about 30 years later. Is it back? This was a photo that Manny took of me as we came into Summer Shai last July. I got out of my rental cars, we crossed the Summer River, and let him take a photo of me at the town sign near the entrance to the town. Okay. This is my friend Obadar, Ogabor. Okay. As you can see in the picture, he's not doing well. He and I were both born in 1947, okay? Uh, we were playmates and we were friends and this was the main reason why I went back. Okay, he's a very depressed man. He lost his wife to cancer seven years ago. He had a major heart attack that ended his career as a house painter. His three grown daughters all have moved far away. He spends his time in his home and shut him, listening to a radio and chain smoking all day. He was thrilled to see us. Okay, the townspeople greeted us as celebrities. They all wanted us to come to their homes and visit. They all prepared homemade cakes and pastries for us to have and to take home with us. Now, when I say there was a river in my backyard, I wasn't kidding. This is it. Okay, the river summers used to flow in my backyard. But in the early 20th century, a project was carried out to block the river's flow by building dikes. The river behind our property became a bow-shaped lake. As a child, I used to go fishing and ice skating in the whole summer. The word hold in Hungarian means dead. It was called the dead summer because it happened in the meandering river and there was an issue of flooding, so the government built dikes, as I indicated, and cut off this section of the river forming a bow-shaped lake. Okay, in the 1970s, there was a major flood, and the level, of the, uh, the level of the lake rose to high levels. Almost 50 years have passed, and the lake is still at its high level, having now become a sportsman's paradise. In fact, if you look right over there, there's a little uh, platform there for fishermen. 
we walked along the bank of the lake, and my next door neighbor had a big sign up advertising his services as a fisherman guide and allowing the use of his property for fishing. Okay, this is the Jewish cemetery in my hometown. It actually looks much better than it did 29 years ago when I last visited. <coughs> Someone apparently paid to have the overgrowth cleared. The piles of cut vegetation are still present. As a child, I remember that, uh, that the iron fencing around the cemetery was stolen by the townspeople to use the electrification of their homes. Okay, this is Miklo, uh, Gabor, his cousin Miklos, and his wife Maria. They're next door neighbors. And, uh, oops, wrong one. Miklos and his wife Maria live in the house that was directly opposite from where my home had been. His parents lived there. Miklos is the person I established contact with uh, on, 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 on the internet through, and through phone calls. He lives next door to Oladar and directly across the street from where my home was. He was waiting for us when we arrived. His wife made delicious pastries for us made me take home a homemade bottle of 100 proof plum slivermints or plum plum brandy. We had only a few short hours because my rental car was due back in Budapest by 6.30 and I had a three and a half hour drive back to Budapest. While visiting with the Bainais, I was told that I must visit their Aunt Mimi who had to see me. Uh, the people were incredible, everybody was giving us pastries, we had to take it, we couldn't insult them. But at the end of the day, I made up a little story. I told my friend, uh, Gabor, Oladar, I said, Oladar, I'm not allowed to take these things back to my hotel. They will not allow it. Could you please do me a favor and take it home with you? You have it. He had no problem with that. <laughs> this is me, Wainai. Interesting story. Okay. The last time I saw Mimi Boynae was in the fall of 1956. Her family lived directly across the street from her. At that time, she was about 16 years old, a beautiful, young, teenage girl. Until I was told that she wanted to see me, I had not thought of her in almost 60 years. But I did remember her. Olga, Miklos, Lenny, and I arrived at Mimi's home, and she was waiting for us with delicious homemade pastries. <laughs> She was very happy to see us and began to tell a story. In December 1956, as my parents prepared to leave Samashai for the last time, they went to the Boinei families to say goodbye to them. The night that my parents visited Mimi's home, she was not there, and she never had a chance to say goodbye to us. This had made heavy on her mind for all those years, and she wanted to tell me the story and have closure. <coughs> An apology. As the day wore on, Oladar turned to me and said, Paul, we are so sorry for the way you were treated and for the things that happened to your family. You know we were not like that. We were like brothers. And my family loved your family. I truly believed it and knew this all along. Otherwise, I would have never come back. Final tally. Other than my parents, my mother's sister, Yuli, and my father's sister, Serena, who moved to the United States in the 1920s, all other immediate family members were exterminated in the Holocaust. This is the uh, gravestone of my great-grandfather, Meyer, who I'm named after, by the way. Also, my Hebrew name is Meyer. Okay. My great-grandfather, Meyer, who died in 1939, is buried in Chengir. He is the last immediate relative who died of natural causes prior to World War II. Now, most of you in this room have extended families. You lived your life having grandparents, and in some cases, even great-grandparents. They may be deceased, but you have your memories of them. And in most cases, you can visit the cemeteries where they're interred. My situation is different. I never had grandparents. 
They were exterminated in 1944. You are looking at the grave of the only immediate family member, other than my parents, who is buried in the cemetery whose grave I can visit. By the way, this stone has been restored uh, through my aunt's family in Israel. Okay, I'm basically done with the presentation, and this presentation is dedicated to the memory of my parents, Dave, Dejah Rosenfeld, and Sarah Cheryl Rosenfeld, and the six million uh, others who perished. And if you're interested, if somebody was not here today, you can basically see this same presentation on YouTube. Simply type in a Holocaust Memorial by Paul Rosenfeld. You can view the original presentation that I did in Florida last year. And by the way, the uh, little girl standing on the car over there is my daughter, Jamie. Jamie, could you stand up for a second and wave? And the young man over here making the funny face is a stand up for a minute. And folks, that's it. If there are any questions, uh,